There are two ways to view the stars, as they really are and as we might wish them to be. These are the Pleiades, a group of young stars astronomers recognize as leaving their stellar nurseries of gas and dust. And this is the Crab Nebula, a stellar graveyard where gas and dust are being dispersed back into the interstellar medium. Inside it is a dying pulsar. Both the Pleiades and the Crab Nebula are in a constellation that astrologers long ago named Taurus the Bull. They imagined it to influence our daily lives. Astronomers say that the planet Saturn is an immense globe of hydrogen and helium, encircled by a ring of snowballs 50,000 kilometers wide, and that Jupiter's great red spot is a giant storm raging for perhaps a million years. But the astrologers see the planets as affecting human character and fate. Jupiter represents a regal bearing and a gentle disposition, and Saturn the gravedigger fosters, they say, mistrust, suspicion, and evil. To the astronomers, Mars is a place as real as the Earth, a world awaiting exploration. But the astrologers see Mars as a warrior, the instigator of quarrels, violence, and destruction. Astronomy and astrology were not always so distinct. For most of human history, the one encompassed the other. But there came a time when astronomy escaped from the confines of astrology. The two traditions began to diverge in the life and mind of Johannes Kepler. It was he who demystified the heavens by discovering that a physical force lay behind the motions of the planets. He was the first astrophysicist and the last scientific astrologer. The intellectual foundations of astrology were swept away 300 years ago, and yet astrology is still taken seriously by a great many people. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to find a magazine on astrology? Virtually every newspaper in America has a daily column on astrology. Almost none of them have even a weekly column on astronomy. People wear astrological pendants, check their horoscopes before leaving the house. Even our language preserves an astrological consciousness. For example, take the word disaster. It comes from the Greek for bad star. The Italians once believed that disease was caused by the influence of the stars. It's the origin of our word influenza. The zodiacal signs used by astrologers even ornament this statue of Prometheus in New York City. Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods. What is all this astrology business? Fundamentally, it's the contention that which constellations the planets are in at the moment of your birth profoundly influences your future. A few thousand years ago, the idea developed that the motions of the planets determine the fates of kings, dynasties, empires. Astrologers studied the motions of the planets and asked themselves what had happened last time that, say, Venus was rising in the constellation of the goat. Maybe something similar would happen this time as well. It was a subtle and risky business. Astrologers became employed only by the state. In many countries, it became a capital offense for anyone but the official astrologer to read the portents in the skies. Why? Because a good way to overthrow a regime was to predict its downfall. Chinese court astrologers who made inaccurate predictions were executed. Others simply doctored the records so that afterwards they were in perfect conformity with events. Astrology developed into a strange discipline, a mixture of 
careful observations, mathematics, and record keeping with fuzzy thinking and pious fraud. Nevertheless, astrology survived and flourished. Why? Because it seems to lend a cosmic significance to the routine of our daily lives. It pretends to satisfy our longing to feel personally connected with the universe. Astrology suggests a dangerous fatalism. If our lives are controlled by a set of traffic signals in the sky, why try to change anything? Here, look at this. Here's two different newspapers published in the same city on the same day. Let's, uh, let's see what they do about astrology. Suppose you were a Libra that is born between September 23rd and October 22nd. According to the astrologer for the New York Post, a uh, compromise will help ease tension. Well, maybe, it's sort of vague. According to the New York Daily News' astrologer, demand more of yourself. Well, also vague, but also pretty different. It's interesting that these predictions are not predictions. They tell you what to do. They don't say what's going to happen. They're consciously designed to be so vague that it could apply to anybody, and they disagree with each other. Astrology can be tested by the lives of twins. There are many real cases like this. One twin is killed in childhood in, say, a riding accident or is struck by lightning, but the other lives to a prosperous old age. Suppose that happened to me. My twin and I would be born in precisely the same place and within minutes of each other, exactly the same planets would be rising at our births. If astrology were valid, how could we have such profoundly different fates? It turns out that astrologers can't even agree among themselves what a given horoscope means. In careful tests, they're unable to predict the character and future of people they know nothing else about except the time and place of birth. Also, how could it possibly work? How could the rising of Mars at the moment of my birth affect me then? or now. I was born in a closed room. Light from Mars couldn't get in. The only influence of Mars which could affect me was its gravity. But the gravitational influence of the obstetrician was much larger than the gravitational influence of Mars. Mars is a lot more massive, but the obstetrician was a lot closer. The desire to be connected with the cosmos reflects a profound reality. For we are connected, not in the trivial ways that the pseudoscience of astrology promises, but in the deepest ways. Our little planet is under the influence of a star. The sun warms us, it drives the weather, it sustains all living things. Four billion years ago, it brought forth life on Earth. But our sun is only one of a billion trillion stars within the observable universe. And those countless suns all obey natural laws, some of which are already known to us. How did we discover that there are such laws? If we lived on a planet where nothing ever changed, there wouldn't be much to do. There'd be nothing to figure out. There'd be no impetus for science. And if we lived in an unpredictable world where things changed in random or very complex ways, we wouldn't be able to figure things out. And again, there'd be no such thing as science. But we live in an in-between universe where things change all right, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, laws of nature. If I throw a stick up in the air, it always falls down. If the sun sets in the west, it always rises again the next morning in the east. And so it's possible to figure things out. We can do science, and with it, 